Wow, what's up everybody? Once again, it's Brand Man Sean, and today I want to talk about something that's pretty serious to me, and that is why I stopped doing my fast growing music festival. Because so many people have actually asked me this over time, so I decided to do a video specifically talking about it. I've took I touched on it in some places, but you know, we went from zero to 1,000 pretty quickly in terms of attendees. We went from $900 in production costs to $10,000 in production costs by the time the last one occurred over a three year span. And then I just stopped doing it, right? At least that's how most people um, see it. But for those of you who might have heard some of the other backstories in terms of the personal life things, there's actually also a very real business sense um, in, in the way, in the reasoning that I stopped doing it. So I'm going to talk about that in this video. First, we're going to do three things because this isn't just for artists, right? This is for music entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs in general in, in the way I want to break down this particular video. So one, I'm going to show a clip where I just answer somebody telling them my whole thoughts on the festival industry, period. But after that, I'm going to talk about some formulas and some things that I think anybody should consider if you really want to have a career, especially as an entrepreneur, but it's some things that apply to life, period. How you should think about making moves and what businesses you choose to partake in, what do you cut out of businesses, and just how you succeed them in them in general. So without further ado, here's the clip. Um, well, I have some drawbacks about the, the festival industry as well, but <laughs> if we get- I would we love to hear to those. This. All right, so, so one of the, the reasons, all right, when, I, when I got into that, I didn't even initially plan it to be a full-on festival. I kind of actually was working with my homies who wanted to be artists in their collective. I was the only person who didn't want to be seen, right? Uh, everybody, there was all these different face, front-facing brands, except for me, I didn't care. And I threw the festival almost as a bigger event, a better way to market them um, initially, but they didn't have their stuff together first time around. Everybody's inexperienced, cool in that in that regard. But um, as the festival was super dope and people wanted me to, me to bring it back, now I'm like, mm, this might be an actual business. But now I instantly start to go look at the business and understand it as a whole. So you got to remember, I'm coming from a tech background and I'm like, I'm not the most people person I'm, I'm, I'm more introverted really um so to there's low margins festivals are low margins right in, in comparison to especially looking at tech where you can have something like whatsapp have 19 or 50 employees and sell for 19 billion not that that's the most common thing in the world but you understand the difference of margin and scale which is what i was used to to now i'm dealing with hundreds of people all these kind of risk and things like that just to, to, this is just a personal thing for me and the margin wasn't great I, I and i was profitable from the very beginning because i didn't know any other way to me it's just like you're running a business or doing the kind of event you have to profit i learned after as it started to grow and uh, a lot of grimy stuff started to happen and festivals started to see us as a threat, which I didn't even understand why at that period of time to me, it's just like, I, I don't know. I, I didn't understand why at the time I didn't. So, so I didn't know things like most of these festivals had investors behind them and a lot of money behind them. I did not because I had my money and my homeboy who was working at Domino's and my other homeboy was a, a valet. Right. Um, and then I didn't. And then also even looking at bigger festivals, when we look at, um, mm, like the, all the way to tomorrow world and all these things, right? Still smaller margins in comparison to a lot of other products. However, it's just on a far bigger scale, but that's a lot of different moving pieces to move with. So to me, it, that was why I eventually stopped doing it because it took, it takes so much effort and for it to not be my main business, the margin small. I, I believe the industry is just becoming more and more saturated. I watched the bubble happen in Europe. And so, the, so many people are doing these festivals and events and, and, and then regular parties and events are starting to become um, starting to be called festivals and and differentiation is is becoming more and more difficult than so many people fund their festivals with uh, sponsors. And I'm looking at bigger festivals that are far more established that have, still have trouble getting sponsors. So the, like there was like there's so many things business model wise that I didn't necessarily appreciate um, about it unless I wanted to dedicate myself to it. OK, so I want to start off by saying this isn't a festival bashing video. I actually think festivals work for certain people. But if you hear me say in this video that I just showed, it's not for me. 
right? It wasn't something that I wanted to do. I wasn't, wasn't going to commit to it long term, which is something that I think that you had to be if you wanted to actually be successful to the fullest, right? So let me break down one of the categories. So we're going to start off with just personality, things that work for me. When it comes to events, you got to deal with a whole lot of people for relatively low margins. And, and it can seem like a lot of money if you're not used to money at the time, right? But just generally speaking, all of the resources, all of the people you have to bring together for people and the frequency in which events and festivals in general can happen creates a pretty low margin business, right? And it's not extremely repeatable month over month, uh, especially at a certain scale. For me, that's not attractive when I've just seen more money for less things or I've looked at business models that could bring more for less, especially when that's just not my thing, right? That's not who I want to be long-term in a career. And we'll get deeper into some of the margins later. Because another thing about it though is a huge part of the business model is raising money, not only through sponsors, but then also a lot of these people, as I kind of mentioned, had investors, right? And for me, I actually bootstrapped mine from ground zero, pretty much 90% of it was all my money, right? So probably 95% of the last time. So, and the thing about that is, that's a lot of risk to be throwing in based off of how these festivals are ran. It can be pretty stressful. It's almost an accepted thing that people won't buy tickets to the last minute. That's just the event space in general. Even if you can get a lot of front end tickets, the majority of the money won't come in to pretty close to the actual event. So you have a lot of money floating. If you're putting that all up yourself and you're not necessarily in a position to, you know, weather that storm, then it could be pretty stressful. And then managing the artists and, and all those things. And, and granted, I like to say I was doing a lot of this stuff, a lot more work than I should have been. I could have had a lot better systems in place or a lot, uh, a lot more people in place to take as much responsibility. But that was just the nature of how this thing grew. Didn't expect it to really grow as fast as it did. So that's another part of it, right? Just the personality in general. I'm not trying to deal with as many people on a regular basis. That's just not, not me. And then the stress that it brings. And I want to make sure I, I don't even skip anything. So the fact that big festivals struggle with sponsors, period. Not just any festival who is trying to get sponsors. A lot of big, well-known names have issues getting sponsors it's still a game that you have to play and that's just not a thing for my personality as well like that that selling 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 trying to ask people for money again you see i bootstrapped i'm more the personality where i'm gonna go, go do it myself as opposed to waiting for people to kind of approve it or green light it or support it all right so those primary things just personality wise make it a little more or a little less uh, attractive to me but again that's just me so I don't fault people who really pursue that that industry and do it full time but also it became a question of impact right and impact is the huge part for me that was the biggest biggest part because at the end of the day even though it was only one time a year it took about three months at least of a lot of focus and prep and leading up to that event and then even at least two weeks at least two weeks afterwards to kind of close everything in make sure everybody was paid um, get all the production uh, well post-production ready and have things tied in the bow just in case it got ran another year all right all that takes a lot of time and there were other areas that i was a far more impact outside of being a festival so that means I have to deal with these switching costs and let me break it down like this I'll pull up my nice little graphic all right check this out here's the model you got two things one thing is over here one thing is over there all right we can call this thing the festival and this thing let's just call it other stuff for now or the other things that I'm doing and as I said the ceiling was a lot higher it's greater impact for me over here all right and the big thing though that most people miss out when they're doing too many things and too many businesses let's just stick with two things is cost the cost of time money and resources so you can say i'm over here and when you're over here you're not spending the energy that you have or could be spending over here 
that alone can be detri detrimental, especially if you have some competitors and you need to be moving along because while you're over here, all right, somebody's moving ahead over here or they're catching up. And then while you're over here, somebody over here is getting that much further ahead of you, right? But that's what a lot of people can easily understand. What a lot of people miss out on is something even greater. You think you're super efficient with your time, right? All right, I start this at five o'clock and then I start doing this at 5.30, right? Nah, it sounds great, but at the end of the day, there's that switching cost, that 30 minutes. How long did it take you to get there? How long did it take you to get from starting one thing to starting up the next one? Because it's not just on switch, off switch, right? You have this additional cost, the switching cost of your mind having to stop focusing on one thing and then starting to take in the information to begin to focus on another thing. And then if the worlds are too attached, at least there's some synergy between festivals and some of the other stuff I was doing in music. But if it's too unattached, then you're really starting over. It was like if I'm doing something in festivals and then some other space in music and tech, which I was at some point, right? Uh, like tech or real estate, right? Like things that have nothing to do with each other. There's an additional cost, but again, another thing unseen other than switching costs is the big one, which is momentum. You cannot undervalue momentum when it comes to business and when it comes to competition, sports, any of these things, because when you have momentum, that's when you start to get an exponential result, right? One starts to equal 10 versus one equaling one, and then one equaling two, and then one equaling three. Like you build that momentum to the point that you put in an input of one and you get back 10. But if you start over and you go back over here, you lose all of that momentum right or you lose half of that momentum at the very least just some of that momentum and when you're starting with very few resources you don't have the ability to split those resources up into too many things because you also have to consider your regular life and whatever else you're doing you split those resources up into too many things then you'll never get to a level of excellence and if you never get to a level of excellence, then you're not gonna be able to truly do multiple things and take advantage of those new things because now you have resources to invest in them other than your literal physical presence and time. So that's the way I thought about it and how I started to make that decision. And that's what I was left with, right? Could I get more impact by continuing to do these things, even though I can do it eight months out of the year without any distraction from the festival, what happens when let's say I have a competitor and I'm not even there was really no competitors to really think about in that way at that time. But what if I had a competitor, right? In that time where I'm stopping and they're still going and they're either catching up or getting that much further ahead of me. Right. Or just the fact that I'm that much further away from my goals. I, and I could be that much closer. Like that simple formula and thought process for me is paramount in understanding what I'm gonna put my energy into and what I'm not going to. Because at the end of the day, like nobody can do this multitasking thing like people say they can. Like when you were thinking about one thing, then you're not thinking about another thing. When you're focused on too many things, then you're not focused. It's, it's a lie, right? Like distractions exist the moment you choose something to focus on. Without focus, then there is no distraction. So if you're just doing all of these things, you're, you're literally not focused and you're probably not doing anything well. And that's what I found myself getting to because everything started to get to a point where it was on such a high level that for anything to move forward, something had to go. And the festival is what was a choice. And that was actually not just a festival. It was like two or three other things that I was doing that, well, some of them just, I mean, it, it wasn't that I shouldn't have been doing them. It was just that I just didn't have the capacity of, uh, to do everything. Just period. I didn't have the capacity and I felt like I was going to let a lot of people down. And I'm never going to put myself in a position knowingly that I can, where I can't give people the energy and commitment that I think that they're worth. Right. Especially when they're committed to doing their goals. So that's how we get to choosing the festival. Well, choosing the festival to be the thing that went. I'm not going to get into the other things, but last but not least, a huge thing that I want to talk about is business models. And this is something that reminds me of what a lot of music professionals really need to 
avoid. It's, a, it's a super prevalent in music. I see a lot of entrepreneurs on this in general, but it's super prevalent in music where people think they need to have four or five different businesses. They think they're popping because they have one LLC and another LLC and I, I manage some artists and I and I got this and I got that. And you're doing too many things, especially alone. Because again, when I talk about switching costs and the level of being great, you're not gonna be that doing that many things, especially when you're starting from ground zero and you don't have the resources. Breaking through to another level, right? It takes concentration, like a nail breaking through the wall. It's concentrated at that point so it can break through. And then you can start to, you know, spread out a little bit. So that's the thought process that I had to go through. But why I say music professionals in general is because everybody thinks that they're an owner, right? And everybody's coming from an I'm an entrepreneur perspective. But if you really start to look at the landscape, it's a lot less... <sighs> entrepreneur entrepreneur or a lot less companies and a lot more self-employed people all right there's a lot of contractors for hire and yes you own your llc on paper but it's just you and there's nothing wrong with that either i don't knock anybody who wants that for themselves because again i, I know a lot of people who do that they love that and that's what they want but there's a lot of people who think they're in process of building an empire they think they're in process of building a business or a company when they don't realize you don't have any assets that you can sell. You don't have any systems that you can sell because that's what gets sold. People buy systems, people buy assets. Uh, you, you can't just have yourself. And a lot of these people, if you start to look, right, even people that are successful, you might consider them successful. They have all these great artists that are associated with them and, you know, they're in their 40s and they make good money. They're really living a day to day middle class life or a month to month middle class life, which, again, especially if you come from a certain environment, is nothing wrong with that either. But the but the truth is, though, when you have a moment happen, when you have something like all touring stops or when you have something happen like whatever, <laughs> like anything major that stops the money in that way. They're in the same place as so many other people that are working regular nine to five jobs. And the whole point for me, especially of entrepreneurships, is yes, to have the freedom in terms of my day to day work. I, I love that aspect of it. But when I think about money, I'm talking about generating rating wealth that doesn't have to be threatened by one month of no paycheck. Right. Or one client leaving. Right. Like actually building something that's not completely reliant on connections. And that's what most businesses, that's the biggest intellectual property, right? That a lot of these businesses or movers and shakers in the industry typically have. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. I got this connection and this connection. And because you know, these people, you get this business, but at some point you have to transfer that. Cause I'm not saying that you, you need to leave that be, that's a real thing that you can use to your advantage. It is leverage. But at some point, you got to move that over into real assets, right? Something that can be sold. And that's my goal when I think about companies. I don't really care to build a business just to be a lifestyle business. But I can build a lifestyle business to help me have the leverage or time to build a business that I believe that can give me true wealth. So there's a process. And the reality that you can get yourself to in the same way i even looked at the music and um not the music industry the music festival is at some point you have to understand business models and have realistic expectations because a lot of these business models well pretty much all business models they have their their limitations they have a ceiling and the the ceiling that i was looking at when it comes to the festival was a lot lower than the ceiling of what i wanted to achieve so Let's look at Coachella Festival. We know that's pretty much the biggest festival out there. They, in 2017, they made $114 million, I believe, in those, in those weekends or those days that it, that it happened. That's great. That's a lot of money. But there's a lot of that money that goes into overhead and so many things. And, they, and there's so many people connected to it. But even if we look further back, Coachella was started by the promoters who own Golden Voice. It was a promotion company, right? And that's something I would have had to do, right? I would have had to really, to make this really, this thing work as a festival. It couldn't have been one festival. Those guys were throwing like 50 punk rock shows in a year, 
right, or over two years, so maybe 25 a year. That's a lot of shows, and that's one thing I realized. Oh, to extend this business model, since my festival exists one time a year, I'm gonna have to do more events to make more money because this is my circle of confidence now, and that means I should create a promotion company. I don't wanna be a promoter. I never wanted to be a promoter. My festival was really just a, a way to get my creativity out and do a really, really dope idea. I just happen to be somebody who knows how to market very well. And a lot of people even mistook me for a promoter, right? So understanding that though, those guys did that in 1981. That's when they started. And then in 2001, I believe, two years after, after Coachella, they were bought out by AEG, right? The Anschutz, they were bought out. Seven million dollars, 20 years, seven million dollars. That's too low of a margin for me, right? Just because I come from probably there's a bias of coming from the tech world and things like that where I've seen numbers, certain numbers happen faster, but also that's a long time to be in something that I don't like and is a lot harder for me to do just because I can be good at it. We all know after a certain period of time, there's a ceiling when that's just not, there's not a certain level of passion or joy um, attached to it or, if it, you know, so I knew that wasn't going to be something I wanted to stay in that long to make. Granted, it might be a little bit more money now because of inflation and the, the saturated market of, of events. But that wasn't something I wanted to do. But if you look at that again, 20 years, $7 million, that shows you some sense of a ceiling. And they were bought out, right? So if they were bought out for only $7, $7 million and they had to be bought out by this investor group to scale over another 10 years. 15, well, maybe, well, shoot, almost 20 years now to get to that 100 plus million dollars. Now you have to say, okay, what really are the margins? Because that means the investor group is probably funding most of that. And I would be in the founder role. So going that long just to give, to sell out for relatively speaking that little, so even, even though it goes to a higher multiple, what is my actual ownership in that? that's just not the business that I'm looking to run, right? And it's not worth my particular time. And what you should do is always understand the limitations of your business model. It's nothing wrong with any business model, you know, uh, you know in, in and of itself. But it's you understanding the business model because the problem comes when your goals exceed the actual business model you have and you think your business model will help you achieve that. Again, like I said, lifestyle business. I'm, I can create a lifestyle business, and a lifestyle business is essentially it's a company that you can't sell, right? It's just you. You're making an income, but no one's going to buy it because there's no real assets, there's no real IP, there's no real um, there's, there's 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 just nothing to buy. No real systems. Without you, it really doesn't exist, or it's not worth somebody else's time. And you see this a lot on shows like Shark Tank. People are like, ah, yeah, that's that's cool. It's a great company, but that's a $5 million a year business. I'm an investor. I'm never going to make my money back, right? I'd rather build business ultimately that if needed, I can exit for a certain amount of money. And But a lifestyle business could put me in a position where I'm still free in my own time. I'm making a certain amount of money and I take some of that extra money to then start the other business, right? So Again, you can use these business models as tools, but if you don't pay attention to the limitations that exist in certain places, like uh, I'm not going to even get into certain nuances of businesses in the uh, music industry or certain types of businesses, because I'm moving through certain things right now. And I want to save that after I do certain things. So you can hear me talk about certain things and I could even show and speak on my own experience. But that's the overview. And that's how you should start thinking about your business. You have to walk through these lot these logic. <laughs> you have to walk through this logic because there's a lot of traps that make you feel like you're an owner, a boss, a CEO, or whatever it is. Especially in music, when in, at the end of the day, even if you are, th the limitation and the ceiling is so low that it's not even worth it. That's it for this particular video. I'll be doing more videos every once in a while from this um, type of voice in terms of just like, look, man, I made certain mistakes or I went through certain things and made some decisions. You guys can, uh, you know, learn from it. And also 
make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that notification button. We will be giving out, you know, every once in a while, some subscribers, uh, some subscriber prizes. If you, if you follow, you subscribe, we will send subscriber specific free, free ads out there for you guys to get some things. And other than that, as always, if you like this video, hit that like button. If you like it, you might as well share it. And if you're not subscribed, baby, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button.